I ask Russ to lead that song, Home of the Soul, because it talks there about the rest of God. It says, yes, a, a sweet rest is remaining for the true children of God. And that's going to be our question for this morning. Will you enter God's rest? And God's rest has been a major theme of chapters 3 and 4 as we've been working through the book of Hebrews on Sunday mornings. A place of rest. And of course, in Hebrews chapter 3, he's using this term, a place of rest, in terms of the promised land. That the children of Israel, as they came out of Egypt, led by Moses, they were headed toward this place of rest, the, the promised land of God, Canaan's land. And you and I are headed toward the promised land as well. And what do we need to do in order to enter God's rest? And there are two major things that we'll see in this passage that will determine whether we enter or whether we do not enter. And there are strong warnings in this passage. But there's also very strong encouragement for you and I this morning. Number one, if we're going to enter God's rest, it's all about the response of our heart when we hear the Word of God. It all comes down to the heart. It all comes down to how we respond when the Word of God touches our heart. And there's a, you know, there's a choice that we have to make. Will we take the Word of God into our hearts or will we disregard it and reject it? And those who go astray in their hearts, they go astray in their lives. And if we continue to go astray in our lives, we can't enter God's rest. And so here is the strong warning for us, but... Number two, the thing about entering God's rest that we'll see is do we trust the work of Jesus Christ as our high priest? Because no one will ever enter God's rest apart from Jesus Christ, apart from His work as our high priest. And we're going to talk about what that means this morning. And that's encouraging for us. That should give us great confidence and great hope uh, because we do have help from God on our journey to this promised land. And so, look with me at Hebrews chapter 4, and verse 9. The author here, he says, So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. There remains a Sabbath rest. That's where we're headed. And we're not talking here for us about the land of Canaan. We're not talking about the promised land. Uh, and, and as he says here, he's going to show us that there still remains a rest for us. And of course, he's talking about heaven. But you look up at verse, at verse 8 for a moment. He says, For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. You see, he's quoting from the Psalms. And David spoke of another day of rest. But what he's saying is that David, he wrote this hundreds of years after the conquest of the promised land. Uh, after they came in with Joshua, who was the successor of Moses. They came in and they took and they settled the land. And now hundreds of years later, David is writing and saying, you better be careful that you enter that rest. And so the, the author here is taking that from David and saying, Look, there was still a promised land coming in the time of David. Uh, it was fulfilled in, in a way back under Joshua as they came in and entered the land, but there's a greater and fuller fulfillment still coming. And for you and I, there's a greater and, and fuller fulfillment still coming. We're going to enter the rest of God in heaven. And it's a place of rest. It's a place of rest. Look at verse 10. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works, as God did from his. Place of rest. Doesn't that sound nice? Doesn't that sound good? A place of rest. 
Heaven is that place. And just as God rested on the seventh day from His works, so we too will enter that rest with Him. And we struggle mightily in life at times. Life can be hard. And sometimes we grow weary. Sometimes we grow tired. Sometimes we hurt. We struggle with temptation. We struggle with the problems of this life. But one day, we're going to rest with our Father. And there's going to be no more troubles and no more sorrows and no more pain. No more sickness. No more dying. Are you looking forward to entering that rest? We need to make sure that we enter it. That's, that's the warning part of this. We need to make sure that we enter it. Look at verse 11. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest, so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. Be diligent to enter that rest. Diligent. He's saying you need to make every effort in your life to enter that rest. You need to be serious about this. You need to strive. You need to do your best to enter the rest of God. Be diligent. Take pains with the things of salvation. Because there is a time of rest coming, but the time of rest is not right now. We need to be working for the Lord right now. We need to be striving. We need to be following and obeying the Lord right now. So when he says, be diligent to enter his rest, doesn't that sound like, doesn't it sound like he's saying, this is on us and, and we, we have to make sure that we do enough, that we're worthy to enter? We need to be careful not to take it that way. There's nothing that we could do to be worthy to enter of ourselves. Uh, it's all about faith in Jesus Christ, as we've said over and over again in multiple sermons and classes in your own studies. It's about Jesus. It's about the work of Jesus. This isn't about earning anything. And, and you can see that when you look at Old Testament Israel. He's been using the, the Israelites as an example throughout this section. You think about the Israelites... Did God bring them into the promised land because they were great and mighty? Did He bring them into the promised land because they were something special out of all the other nations of the earth? Did they earn anything with God? Is that why they entered into the land? And the answer to that is no. It was all by God's doing. It was all by God's grace. And God led them into this land and God said to them, I'm going to give you this land. I'm going to fight for you. It's all me, in other words, God says. But what does God expect from His people? He wants them to be obedient. He wants them to listen to His voice. He wants them to be faithful. So it's not about earning anything, but it is about being faithful to God and listening to God. Are you making are you making every effort in your spiritual life? We need to be diligent to enter. It's so easy to neglect our spiritual condition. It's so easy to not take the things of the Lord very seriously. And this is a recipe for disaster to not take it seriously. It's always been a recipe for disaster. You can see it in God's people throughout the history of God's people. And so he says, again, looking at verse 11, Therefore let us be diligent to enter that rest, so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. The children of Israel, the vast majority of them, were very disobedient to God. They were faithless. They weren't listening to the Word of God. They weren't responding to the Word of God. And he says, you and I better be careful that that doesn't happen to us, that we would, would not follow that same example of disobedience. And so we have to take it seriously. We have to listen. We have to take God's Word to heart. 
And we see that in verse 12. Look with me at verse 12. He's going to show us that there does remain a rest for the children of God, but our entrance depends upon how our heart is responding to the Word of God. That's what it all comes down to. Look at verse 12. For the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and is able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Did you know that at this moment, God is searching your hearts? He's searching your heart to see how are you going to respond to my word. And the word of God reveals so much about us. And, and we've seen in Hebrews 3 and in Hebrews 4, the state of the heart is everything to God. You look back with me for a moment. Look at, at chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. Here he's warning the, the, uh, the church using the children of Israel as an example. He says, therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. The state of the heart is everything to God. How are you going to respond to His voice? Look at uh, chapter 3 and verse 10. Therefore I was angry with this generation and said, they always go astray, where? In their hearts. They always go astray in their heart and did not know my ways. Look at verse 12 of chapter 3. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. See, God is searching the heart. God is supremely concerned about our hearts. And I see the heart, or I see the Word of God, rather, is like a, it's like a forcing function. God... God touches our heart through His Word when it's proclaimed. And, and it, it shakes our heart. It pierces our heart. But the question is, what are you going to do with that? Are you going to respond to His Word? Because make no mistake, the Word of God, He says, is living. This is not just words on a page. Brethren, this is not literature. This is not just history. These words of God are alive because they come from the mouth of God. So they're, they're infused with His life. His Word imparts spiritual life to those who will take it in and accept it. This is powerful. And He says the Word of God is living and it's active. That means it's, it's uh, effective. It's um, powerful. I always think about, every time I preach or teach, I think about uh, Isaiah 55, verse 11. God there speaking about His own Word. He says, It will not return to me empty. Or void. The Word of God will not return to Him empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. There is always something happening when the Word of God is read or when it is proclaimed. And people may say, well, I don't feel like anything's happening. Well, that's kind of the point. Because if we just disregard it and we just go on and it just in one ear and out the other, there's actually something happening. And it's, a lot of times it's a hardening process. I don't, I don't care about the Word of God. I'm not really responding to the Word of God. And people get harder in their hearts. On the other hand, when people take it in and hear it and, and, and listen and strive to obey it, very powerful things are happening. God is at work in us through His Word. The, live of, the Word of God is living and active, and He says it's piercing. It's, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. You remember the, the day of Pentecost? When Peter preached that first sermon and 
It says the people were pierced to the heart. They said, men and brethren, what shall we do? The Word of God can get in us and pierce us right into our inner being. It's sharp. That's not always a comfortable feeling, by the way, is it? It pierces us. But what are you going to do with that? How are you going to respond to that? That's the question. The Word of God judges. Looking again at verse 12, you, you see at the end of the verse there, it pierces as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Have you ever had the Word of God just hit you? Right between the eyes, as we would say? Well, really, it's hitting you right in the heart. And it's able to get down into our innermost being. And it's interesting to me that people can hear the very same message but there will be very different reactions sometimes. Sometimes people, it, it hits them, it pierces them, and they say, oh, I need to change, and, and I, I've got work to do on myself, and I, 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 want, I want to change. And then other people will leave angry, upset. Why? Because the Word of God has pierced them and has exposed their thoughts and exposed their intentions. And that's not a comfortable thing. But it's a needed thing. He says in verse 13, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. There is no hiding from God. God sees right into our very being and everything is just laid open before his eyes. And you can wear a mask and you can fool people. I've done that in my life. But you're not hiding anything from God. He sees it all. And on the other hand, you know, people can think evil about you and think that, that you're up to something wrong, but you know in your heart, I'm not, that's not me. I'm not doing that. And God sees that too. Everything is laid open and bare before Him. Every thought, every intention, everything is laid right before His eyes. And He can see it all right now in your heart and in mine. You can see it all. Now that can be a very encouraging message, right? Because I, I want God to see all of me. I, I want Him to search me. I want Him to know me. I want, I want the light of God to, to shine on me so that it can expose and so that I can make changes in my life. But on the other hand, this can be a very stark, very sobering message. Because I know God sees every part of me I know His Word is exposing every part of me. And I know the state of my heart. Right? I know the state of my heart. I know my deepest thoughts. I know that I have fallen short of God's holiness. I know that my heart has not always been right. I know that my intentions have not always been good. I know the struggles that I have with sin. I know the doubts that I sometimes have in my own heart. And God sees all of that too. And so when it comes down to it, I know that at times I'm no different than those Israelites who were faithless, who were disobedient. And so what chance do I have of making it? I mean, if, this, if everything stopped here in this passage, what chance do we have of making it? God sees all of my sin and all of my shortcomings and all of my failures. What hope do I have? But this is where the work of Jesus as our high priest comes in. And this, this is something our souls. It's like the song we sing, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus." Because it's not only our heart response to the Word of God that will determine our entrance, 
but it's also, thankfully, the work of Jesus on our behalf as our high priest. We've got to trust Him as our high priest. And so He says in verse 14, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. We have a great high priest in Jesus. Jesus is above all. Jesus is the greatest, and he's been given as a high priest. And you look at the, the role of the high priest in Old Testament times. What was his role? Well, it was to be a spiritual leader of the people. It was to help those who were weak and help those who were struggling. And very importantly, it was to offer up sacrifices for the sins of the people. And once a year, the high priest would go into the, to the Holy of Holies. He would go in behind the veil in the tabernacle or in the temple. And he would offer the blood of calves and goats on behalf of the people for their sins. But do you know what we have in Jesus? We have a high priest who has entered into the very presence of God in heaven itself and has offered his own blood for our sins. Not the blood of animals. He's offered his own blood once and for all time so that we can be cleansed, so that we can be righteous, so that we can be holy in God's sight. And so because of that, he says, let us hold fast our confession we have confessed Jesus Christ. We have confessed our allegiance to Jesus as our Savior. He says, hold on to that. Because if we don't hold on to Jesus, we don't have any hope. And that's what he's telling them. Hold, hold fast to your confession. He's our only hope. Don't back away from him. And look at the blessings that we have in him. Look at verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Isn't it good to know that Jesus can sympathize with you? He can sympathize with your weaknesses. Jesus knows what we're going through. That's the reason why he came to earth and lived as a human being, so that he could know what we're going through. He knows the struggles that we have. He knows when we're feeling weak. He knows what's that, what that's like, whether it's, uh, you know, sometimes we have spiritual weaknesses. It's not sin, but we're struggling. Jesus knows what that's like. Jesus knows about bodily weakness and sickness and illness. He knows about all of those things. And because we have a high priest who has been tempted as we are, yet without sin, that means that he knows what it's like to go through temptation. He knows what it's like to struggle against sin. He knows what it's like to have these weight, this weight and these trials to press down upon him. And he says, I can sympathize with you. I know what that's like. And so we're not alone in our struggles. But in all of this, Jesus never sinned. That's what qualifies him to be our high priest and to make atonement with his own blood. Jesus can sympathize with us. Look again at verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. I, Lord, I know who I am. I know how sinful I have been. I know my struggles. But God says to us, because Jesus is your high priest, draw, come close to me. We can come close to God with confidence, not with cowering and with fear, but with confidence. How is that possible? Because Jesus is our high priest who offered his blood for us. And so there, 
You know, there is nothing that separates you from God. If you're in Christ Jesus and you're walking with Jesus, that doesn't mean perfection, by the way. You're walking faithfully with Jesus in the light. You know, there's nothing that separates you from God anymore. You and I can come as close to God as we want to come to God, but it's all because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And so God is inviting us. Would you draw near to me? Come closer to me. And we can do that because of the blood of Jesus. Because He is our high priest. And as we draw near to God, you know what we'll find? Looking again at verse 16. Mercy and grace to help in time of need. Jesus knows how to help us. Jesus is merciful to us. He doesn't give us what we deserve. He gives us His grace. That means Jesus is for us. He's pulling for us. He wants to help us. He wants to bless us. And so does God our Father. So would you draw near to Him with confidence? And so you take all of this together, and what does it tell us? We can be sure that we will enter God's rest if we hold fast to Jesus. And if we would respond to God in His Word. So let's keep responding to His Word. Let's keep holding on to Jesus, knowing that because of Him we stand forgiven, we stand in a right relationship with God, we stand in His mercy and grace with confidence to His throne. So if you're here this morning and, and you need prayers of the congregation, we'd be happy to pray with you. If there's anyone here that needs to respond to the invitation of Christ to put him on in baptism for the forgiveness of your sins, to start a new life with him, we invite you to do that and let it be known now or at any time. Let's stand together now and let's sing.